Good afternoon, my name is Emma Tegadine and I am an employment law partner here at Gunner Cook. Welcome to this afternoon's webinar on managing drug and alcohol misuse in the workplace. Excessive alcohol consumption and misuse of drugs by staff can be a serious issue for employers. The National Institute for Health and Care Excellence defines harmful drinking as a pattern of alcohol consumption that is causing health problems, including psychological problems such as depression, alcohol-related accidents and physical illness. These high-risk drinkers can become alcohol dependent, which NICE defines as characterised by craving, tolerance, preoccupation with alcohol and continue drinking despite harmful consequences. Drug misuse means the use of illegal drugs and the misuse of prescribed drugs and other substances. There is a high economic cost of drug and alcohol misuse. In a survey conducted by the Chartered Institute of Personnel and Development in 2007, four out of 10 employers saw alcohol as a significant driver of lost productivity through absenteeism, and a third of employers reported similar concerns relating to drugs. Estimates of the economic cost of alcohol misuse are high, and a 2012 Cabinet Office estimate estimated that alcohol misuse costs the English economy £7.3 billion each year. Alcohol Concern estimates that employees who misuse alcohol are two to three times more likely to be involved in workplace accidents. And finally, according to the Global Burden of Disease Survey 2013, Drug use disorders are now the third most common cause of death amongst people aged between 15 and 49 in England. The workplace itself can be a factor in encouraging increased levels of drug use and alcohol consumption. According to the independent review into the impact on employment outcomes of drug or alcohol addiction and obesity, which was concluded in 2016, particular risk factors are long working hours, jobs with high physical demand and risk of injury, monotonous work, poor supervision, and job insecurity. Today, today's webinar will cover a number of issues relating to drug and alcohol misuse at work. We'll look at the following points. Firstly, health and safety issues. Secondly, how to spot the signs of the possible drug or alcohol misuse at work. Dealing with drug or alcohol dependency as a health issue. Whether drug and alcohol misuse can be dealt with as a conduct issue. The role of medical evidence and other evidential issues. How to reduce the risk of unfair dismissal claims. Potential disability discrimination issues. The lawfulness of drug or alcohol testing. Data protection issues the benefits of implementing effective substance misuse policies, and we'll also be looking at a few key cases in this area of law. First thing we're going to look at this afternoon is health and safety obligations. All employers have a general duty to ensure, as far as reasonably practicable, the health, safety and welfare of their employees. This means that if an employer knowingly allows an employee who is under the influence of drugs or excess alcohol to continue working, and this places the employee or other people at risk, the employer could be liable. Similarly, employees are themselves subject to a duty to take reasonable care of themselves and of others who could be affected by what they do, and they can be liable to charges if their alcohol consumption or drug use puts others' safety at risk. In addition, employers are under a common law duty to take reasonable care of the health and safety of their employees. The management of health and safety at work regulations place an additional duty on employers to make a suitable and sufficient assessment of the risks to health and safety of employees and others affected by their undertaking. It is an offence to drive a vehicle whilst being under the influence of drugs or while having more than the legal limit of alcohol in your blood. 
and it is also a criminal offence for certain types of worker to be unfit through drink or drugs while working on railways, trams and certain other forms of transport. The operators for whom those employees work will also be guilty of an offence unless they have shown all due diligence in trying to prevent those offences from being committed. Moving on now to looking for signs of substance misuse. Recognising the signs of drug or alcohol misuse can sometimes be difficult. If an employee has been drinking or taking drugs within a few hours of being at work, there may be obvious signs. The employee may smell of alcohol, may be disorientated, may be unable to carry out a normal task, or may have dilated pupils. Other types of behaviour that may suggest that an employee may have a drug or alcohol problem include short-term frequent absences, erratic performance, reduced productivity, complaints about the employee's work, patterns of depression or fatigue, particularly after the weekend, unusual irritability or depression, sudden mood swings, inappropriate behaviour, deterioration in relationships with colleagues, appearing confused, poor timekeeping, arriving at meetings smelling of alcohol, lack of discipline, missing business appointments, neglecting their appearance, taking unnecessary risks, dishonesty or theft, drinking alcohol alone or at lunch times, and being involved, involved in accidents or near misses at work. These issues do not necessarily indicate that an individual has a drink or drugs problem, and they can be symptoms of other problems in a person's life, such as mental health issues or relationship problems. So what should an employer do if there are obvious signs that an employee may be under the influence of alcohol or drug, drugs at work? If there are very obvious signs that an employee is under the influence of alcohol or drugs at work, the employer should take immediate action to stop the employee putting themselves, their colleagues and members of the public at risk. This will usually involve sending the employee home for the rest of the day while the matter is investigated. Let's move on to look now at unfair dismissal, dismissal issues. So employees who have been employed for two years or more with an employer have the right not to be unfairly dismissed. There are only five potentially fair reasons for dismissal in relation to unfair dismissal, and they are conduct, capability, redundancy, illegality, or some other substantial reason of a kind as to justify the dismissal. If an employer has a potentially fair reason for dismissal, the question as to whether a dismissal is fair or unfair will be considered having regard to whether in the circumstances, including the size and administrative resources of the undertaking, the employer acted reasonably or unreasonably in treating it as a sufficient reason for dismissing the employee and the equity and substantial merits of the case. Being under the influence of alcohol or drugs at work may be a capability, i.e. health issue, or a conduct issue. So there are two different potentially fair reasons for dismissing somebody in connection with substance misuse at work, and they are capability and conduct. If an employer suspects that an employee's behaviour or performance is being affected by the misuse of drugs or alcohol, one of the first things the employer should do is identify whether the issue is a conduct or a capability issue and then modify its approach accordingly. Whether substance misuse should be dealt with as a health or conduct issue will depend upon the particular circumstances, the nature of the employee's work and whether potential harm to the employee and others is an issue. What course of action the employer decides to take may also depend on whether the employee appears to be consuming excessive amounts of drugs or alcohol for recreational purposes, or whether he appears to be dependent on drugs or alcohol. 
In cases where there seems to be an addiction issue, the employee may be encouraged to get treatment with a view to returning to work. This type of situation can be distinguished from one-off incidents caused by drug or alcohol misuse, which are more likely to be dealt with as a disciplinary issue. A reason for dismissing an employee will be a potentially fair reason for unfair dismissal purposes if it relates to the capability of the employee for performing the kind of work he was employed to do. Capability can include health reasons. Alcohol and drug dependence usually occurs after prolonged use of substances, which becomes habit forming. When a dependency is formed, not using the particular substance causes cravings and withdrawal symptoms, which usually results in a recurrence of substance misuse. Dependency is a health problem and can damage a person's work life and relationships and can have serious psychological and physical effects. Depending on the circumstances, it may be possible for an employer to fairly dismiss an employee who has a drug or alcohol problem on the grounds of ill health. The following factors will be relevant when determining whether it is reasonable for an employer to dismiss an employee on ill health grounds. The nature of the illness, the prospects of the employee returning to work and the likelihood of the illness recurring, the need for the employer to have someone doing the work, the effect of the absences on the rest of the workforce, the extent to which the employee has been made aware of the position and the employee's length of service. Another important consideration will be whether the employer can be expected to keep the employee's job open any longer. The following factors may be relevant in deciding how long the employer can be expected to wait. The availability and cost of temporary cover, the fact that the employee has exhausted his sick pay, the administrative costs that may be incurred by keeping the employee on the books, and the size of the organisation. In order to ensure that any dismissal is fair, the employer will need to show that it followed a fair procedure before dismissing the employee. In a leading case in this area, the Employment Appeal Tribunal stated that unless there are wholly exceptional circumstances before an employee is dismissed on the grounds of ill health, it is necessary that he should be consulted and the matter discussed with him and that one way or another steps are taken by the employer to discover the true medical position. If an employee approaches the employer and discloses that he is dependent on drugs or alcohol, he should usually be encouraged to seek help and treatment. If the employee has not approached his employer, but his behaviour or appearance suggests that he may be suffering from an addiction, the employer may wish to raise the issue with the employee with a view to referring him for treatment. Approaching a member of staff about a suspected drug or alcohol problem can be daunting. However, the sooner the issue is identified and addressed, the lower the risk is of harm being caused to the employee or others, and the sooner the employee can be referred for treatment. We're going to look now at some practical steps that can be taken uh, when managing a drug or alcohol problem as a health issue. The following practical steps may make the process of identifying a drug or alcohol problem and addressing it with the employee easier. Train managers to recognise the signs and symptoms of addiction. Intervene as early as possible to maximise the prospects of any addiction being treated successfully. Arrange for the employee to be interviewed about the issues in private. Concentrate on the issues relating to poor performance or conduct that have been identified. Present the employee with the facts rather than simply suggesting they are drinking excessively or taking drugs. For example, 
explain that a customer has complained that the employee smelt of alcohol and the circumstances in which the complaint was made. Ask the employee about the reasons for the poor performance and question whether it could be due to a health problem without specifically mentioning drugs or alcohol initially. Make the employee aware of the effects his alcohol misuse or drug misuse is having on his colleagues and the organisation as a whole. If appropriate, discuss the employer's substance misuse policy and any help that is available for the employee, either inside or outside the organisation. Consider obtaining a medical report on the employee's state of health and fitness for work. Offer information and professional help. Provide the contact details of different professional organisations or rehabilitation clinics that can provide treatment. Encourage the employee to seek help from his GP for the provision of confidential advice and assistance. The employee's GP should, in consultation with the employee, take steps to arrange for counselling, treatment and rehabilitation. If the employer has an occupational health service, encourage the employee to refer himself to it or ensure that he is referred by management. Make it clear that the employee's continuing employment depends on them engaging with a treatment programme, but that you will support them. Give the employee time off for treatment if necessary. An employee who is taking time off work to receive treatment for drug or alcohol addiction should be signed off sick and submit sick notes in the usual way. Agree a course of action with the employee and arrange regular meetings with the employee to monitor his progress and discuss any further problems if they arise. Make it clear to an employee who is signed off sick while receiving treatment for drug or alcohol misuse that the aim of treatment and rehabilitation is to ensure optimum recovery and return to work. The employee's progress should be monitored to assess whether he is capable of returning to his duties. In most cases, the employee should be permitted to return to work in the role he was doing before the drug or alcohol problem was recognised. If the employee fails to comply with the referral and the recommendations of the Occupational Health Service, this can then be dealt with as a conduct issue. If the employer decides to support the employee's recovery, and to permit them to return to work once they are fit to do so, it may wish to consider introducing random drug or alcohol testing. It is common for employees to relapse after treatment for drug or alcohol addiction, and employers should be aware that this may happen. The circumstances of the relapse and the individual's response to it are likely to influence the way the employer responds. If it looks unlikely that the employee will be well enough to be able to return to work within a reasonable time frame, or if the employer is not confident that the employee is taking the recommended steps to enable him to recover from his addiction, the employer can deal with the matters in the same way as any other long-term sickness absence issues and take steps, including arranging consultation meetings with the employee and obtaining a medical report which may lead to the individual's eventual dismissal. Taking reasonable steps to ascertain the medical position before deciding to dismiss will be very important if the employee has unfair dismissal rights, or if there is any reason to suspect that the employee may be disabled for the purposes of protection under the Equality Act 2010. The employer should always consult with the employee about any medical evidence. If the employee refuses to cooperate with a request to obtain medical information, it may be possible for the employer to dismiss the employee fairly on the basis of the evidence which is available to it. So we've looked at how to deal with alcohol or drug misuse as a health issue but sometimes employers may wish to deal with it as a conduct issue 
So we're going to turn to that now. So in what circumstances can an employer treat substance misuse as a conduct issue rather than a health issue? Conduct is another potentially fair reason for dismissal, for unfair dismissal purposes. If an employee has been under the influence of drugs or alcohol at work, this is likely to be classed as gross misconduct. If the issue appears to be one of recreational substance misuse, leading to behavioural reliability or other conduct issues, and there is no reason for the employer to believe that the employee is dependent on drug, drink or drugs, it is likely to be appropriate for the issue to be dealt with as a disciplinary matter. If an employee is dismissed on the grounds of misconduct, the dismissal will only be fair if, at the time of dismissal, the employer believed the employee was guilty of misconduct, the employer had reasonable grounds for believing the employee was guilty of misconduct, and at the time it formed that belief, it had carried out as much investigation as was reasonable in the circumstances. If the employee in question has unfair dismissal rights, or in any other case where there appears to be a real risk of the employee bringing an employment-related claim against the employer, the employer will need to make sure that it follows a fair disciplinary procedure which will include carrying out a reasonable investigation. During the investigation, the employer will need to look for evidence that the employee has been under the influence of drugs or alcohol while at work. Some employers mistakenly assume that in order to fairly dismiss an employee for being under the influence of drugs or alcohol at work, it has to be able to prove that the employee was actually under the influence on the relevant date. The burden of proof is not that high. However, the employer will need to carry out a reasonable investigation and have reasonable grounds for believing that the employee was under the influence of drugs or alcohol at work. The employee may claim that he is suffering from a medical condition that bears symptoms which are similar to the symptoms of a person suffering from the effects of taking drugs or consuming alcohol. If these issues are raised, the employer will need to investigate the claims, as there may be another explanation for the employee's behaviour. It may even be possible that the employee could be disabled for the purposes of the Equality Act 2010. We're going to move on now to look at a few cases uh, in the area of uh, misconduct dismissals relating to drug and alcohol misuse. Firstly, the case of McElroy and Cambridgeshire Community Services NHS Trust. Mr McElroy was employed by the Trust as a healthcare assistant. On one particular day, a colleague informed Mr McElroy's line manager, Ms Bannister, that Mr McElroy smelt of alcohol. Ms Bannister interviewed Mr McElroy and took the same view. Mr McElroy claimed that he had had a couple of beers the night before. He was suspended while the matter was investigated. Being unfit for duty through the effects of alcohol was deemed to be gross misconduct under the Trust Disciplinary Policy. The Trust Substance Misuse Policy defined being unfit for duty as meaning the employee was incapable of functioning effectively at work. The Substance Misuse Policy did not prohibit the consumption of alcohol shortly before attending work, but it did recommend that employees avoided doing so. During the investigation, Mr McElroy denied coming to work drunk and suggested that people had been smelling his aftershave. The investigation found that managers had expressed concern about smelling alcohol on Mr McElroy on a number of previous occasions. However, nobody had had concerns about his behaviour or thought that he had been acting as if he was drunk. Patients seemed to like him 
and there had been no other negative reports about him. An occupational health report suggested that Mr McElroy was fit to return to work and that any future concerns should be dealt with under the Trust's substance misuse policy and involve referring Mr McElroy to occupational health. By this time, Mr McElroy had been admitted to hospital with esophagitis, a condition which can be associated with excessive alcohol consumption. Mr McElroy was asked to attend a further appointment with occupational health. However, he refused, refused to do so. Mr McElroy was dismissed for reporting to work under the influence of alcohol and failing to attend a further occupational health meeting. When his appeal against dismissal was unsuccessful, he issued an unfair dismissal claim. The Employment Tribunal held that Mr McElroy had been unfairly dismissed for the following reasons. A reasonable employer would not, in the absence of evidence that Mr McElroy had been incapable of functioning effectively at work, have concluded that Mr McElroy was unfit for duty, as defined by the Trust's own policies and would not have treated smelling of alcohol as amounting to gross misconduct. The reasons for dismissal included Mr McElroy's failure to attend an occupational health appointment. However, this complaint had not been put to Mr McElroy before the disciplinary hearing. And the Trust Substance Misuse Policy stated that a refusal to participate in an occupational health referral would not, in itself, be a ground for disciplinary action. This very useful case emphasises the importance of drafting appropriate disciplinary and substance misuse policies and of adhering to those policies when dealing with drug and alcohol issues. It also demonstrates the importance of dealing with drug and alcohol issues at the earliest opportunity. If Mr McElroy's line manager had confronted him at an earlier stage about the fact that he smelt of alcohol and warned him that this was unacceptable, it may have been easier for the trust to show that his eventual dismissal was fair. It also illustrates the importance of ensuring that the employee has the opportunity to consider and respond to all allegations of misconduct at a disciplinary hearing and that any dismissal is only based on charges which have been properly put to the employee. Even if a dismissal on conduct grounds is found to be unfair, it is worth bearing in mind that it is possible that the employee may have contributed to his own dismissal by being under the influence of drugs or alcohol at work. And this can sometimes result in compensation being substantially reduced. Turning now to another case in this area, Sinclair and Wandsworth Council. Mr Sinclair worked for Wandsworth Council as a business support assistant. He was caught drinking while on duty. When the matter was investigated, he informed his manager that he was an alcoholic. The manager told Mr Sinclair that drinking while on duty was a serious disciplinary offence. But disciplinary proceedings would be put on hold if he agreed to be referred to the Occupational Health Service. Mr Sinclair was reluctant to engage with the Occupational Health Service and said he would prefer to try and stop drinking on his own. He refused to allow the Occupational Health Service to contact his GP. However, when Mr Sinclair's manager advised him that he would have to cooperate with Occupational Health in order to keep his job, he reluctantly agreed to cooperate. A disciplinary hearing took place and he was issued with a final written warning. Just four weeks later, Mrs Sinclair was drunk at work and was suspended so an investigation could take place. 
During the investigation, he claimed that any alcohol which was in his system must have been from the previous night and that he had been referred for counselling by the Occupational Health Service. Neither of these things were true and Mr Sinclair failed to attend an occupational health appointment before the disciplinary hearing. At the disciplinary hearing, Mr Sinclair argued that the hearing should be adjourned as he was cooperating with the Occupational Health Service. However, his request was refused and the hearing went ahead. He was found to have been unfit to work through alcohol and, taking into account his previous warning, he was dismissed. Mr Sinclair claimed unfair dismissal. The Employment Tribunal found that Mr Sinclair had been dismissed on the grounds of misconduct and that the dismissal was unfair for the following reasons. The employer had not given a copy of its alcohol policy to Mr Sinclair until the day before the disciplinary hearing and had never given it to the individuals who were responsible for supervising him, despite the fact that the terms of the policy required it to be circulated to all staff. In addition, the employer had not made it clear to Mr Sinclair exactly what he needed to do in terms of actively seeking treatment for his alcoholism to avoid disciplinary action. This led Mr Sinclair to believe that he was doing all that was expected of him. The tribunal reduced Mr Sinclair's compensation on the basis that he wouldn't have actively engaged in treatment for his alcoholism and would have been dismissed in any event four weeks later. In addition, his compensatory award was reduced on the basis that he contributed towards his dismissal. The main issue for the employer in this case was the fact that it had not followed its own drug and alcohol policy and had not provided a copy of the policy to either the employee or the employee's supervisors. The policy required the employer to give alcoholic employees the chance to keep their jobs by pursuing a course of treatment under the supervision of the employer's occupational health service. However, the employer had not made it sufficiently clear to Mr Sinclair exactly what he was required to do and had not made it clear that he would be dismissed if he did not actively pursue treatment. The Employment Appeal Tribunal's decision in this case also reinforces the possibility that even if an employer gets a dismissal relating to drug or alcohol misuse wrong procedurally, there may be arguments that can be used to minimise the amount of any compensation which is awarded to the employee. The final case in this area we're going to look at relates to uh, being in possession of drugs at work. An employee who is found in possession of drugs at work is likely to be guilty of gross misconduct justifying summary dismissal. In the Astor Stores Limited and Coughlin case, Mr Coughlin, who had worked for the employer for 21 years and had a clean disciplinary record, agreed to meet an Astor employee who was well known for supplying cannabis outside the back door of reception during his break. He received an eighth of an ounce of cannabis wrapped in polythene bag, which he put in his staff locker. The smell of cannabis was noticed, his locker was searched, and when the cannabis was discovered, he was dismissed for gross misconduct. The Employment Appeal Tribunal held that the dismissal was fair. A fair procedure had been followed, and dismissal for a single act of gross misconduct involving the acquisition and possession of unlawful drugs on Alstice premises was within the range of reasonable responses. Turning now to the issue of disability discrimination. The Equality Act 2010 prohibits discrimination in employment in respect of the protected characteristic of disability. 
A person who wishes to bring a disability discrimination claim must show that he has a disability for the purposes of the Act. A person will be disabled for the purposes of the Equality Act if he has a physical or mental impairment, the impairment has a substantial adverse effect on the individual's normal day-to-day -day activities, and the substantial adverse effects are long-term. In order to be long-term, the substantial effects must have lasted or be likely to last for at least one year. Addiction to alcohol, nicotine or any other substance is expressly stated in the legislation not to be an impairment for the purposes of disability discrimination. So individuals who are addicted to a substance do not qualify as being disabled for the purposes of uh, employment law protection. Addiction for this purpose includes a dependency. However, it is very important to recognise that this exclusion does not apply if the addiction is the result of the administration of medically prescribed drugs or other medical treatment. So although drug and alcohol addiction is expressly excluded from protection under the Equality Act 2010, other impairments which are caused by a drug or alcohol addiction may amount to protected disabilities. So addiction which is caused by uh, the administration of medically prescribed drugs, that can amount to a disability. And also, if there are other impairments which are caused by a drug or alcohol addiction, those other impairments may themselves qualify as a disability. The Employment Appeal Tribunal has confirmed that depression, which was caused by alcohol abuse, is not prevented from being a disability merely because addiction to alcohol is excluded from being an impairment. It is also possible that an employee may be suffering from drug or alcohol addiction that has arisen as a result of a condition which amounts to a disability. If an employer knows or has reasonable grounds to believe that an employee is suffering from long-term impairments other than an addiction itself, it should investigate and make reasonable adjustments for the employee if it transpires that the employee has or is likely to have a disability. There is no qualifying period of service requirement for a disability discrimination claim and compensation for disability discrimination is unlimited. This means that an employer who is dealing with an employee who has a drug or alcohol problem should give careful consideration to the possibility that there may be other related health issues which give the employee protection as a disabled person. This possibility should be considered when discussing drug or alcohol issues with the employee investigating conduct or performance issues and when obtaining medical advice. I'd like to look now at substance misuse policies. Not every employer needs to have a standalone policy on substance misuse and there is certainly no specific legal obligation to have one. However, it is considered good practice for an employer to have a policy even if it does not find any evidence of current alcohol or drug misuse, as it is likely to help the employer to deal with any future problems which may arise. Some objectives of a substance misuse policy may be to ensure compliance with legal obligations, assist in the early identification of drug or alcohol dependency, help managers to deal with substance misuse related incidents, Establish guidelines for dealing with misconduct arising from substance misuse. Demonstrate the organisation's commitment to staff health and safety and well-being. Raise awareness amongst staff of the impact of inappropriate use of drugs and alcohol at work. Encourage affected employees to seek help. Provide a consistent process in how the organisation handles drug and alcohol misuse. Explain the circumstances in which drug and alcohol testing will be conducted. 
and provide an understanding of the situation, uh, type of situation in which the employer may offer help to the employee. The following points should be considered when introducing a substance misuse policy. Consider what approach the employer takes to drug or alcohol misuse and the extent to which, which it wishes to offer support to employees who are affected by drug or alcohol addiction. The rules on being under the influence of drugs and alcohol at work. A statement that the policy applies to everyone at all levels. An explanation of the health and safety risk to individuals and their colleagues if a drug or alcohol problem is untreated. Make it clear what the procedures are for dealing with incidents and who is responsible for dealing with them. Emphasise the importance of early identification and treatment of a drug or alcohol problem. Provide details of the help which is available to employees, both internally and externally. Explain when and whether drug or alcohol misuse will be dealt with as a disciplinary matter. State whether the employer wishes to reserve the right to search property belonging to the employer and or the employee for evidence of drug or alcohol misuse. Explain whether the employer has already implemented or wishes to implement random and or forecourse testing for drug or alcohol use. Give assurances in relation to confidentiality and provide for the possibility of employment being terminated on health grounds in certain circumstances. It is worth noting that if the employer wants the right to be able to carry out drug and alcohol testing or to carry out searches uh, of people's property, this should be reflected in employees' contracts of employment. Training is key to the success of any substance misuse policy. If possible, managers should be trained on how to recognise, deal with and act on drug and alcohol problems at work. Although managers don't need to have all the answers, it will help considerably if they are able to signpost people to where they can get help. If a substance misuse policy is introduced, it should be readily accessible and applied fairly and consistently. Turning now to the issue of drug and alcohol testing. If an employer wants to carry out drug and alcohol test, tests, the employee's contract should include a provision which states that they may be required to consent to drug and alcohol testing. Although an employee cannot be forced to undergo testing, a refusal to consent to testing where there is a clause in the contract requiring him to consent is likely to amount to a refusal to obey a lawful order. As long as an employer's request for an employee to submit to a test is reasonable and proportionate in the circumstances, a refusal to be tested may amount to gross misconduct. Whether a refusal to undergo testing will amount to misconduct will depend on all the circumstances, including the reasons why the employer introduced the testing, the means used to undertake the testing, what information has been given to staff about it, the particular reasons why the employee is being asked to undergo testing and any particular reasons they may have for refusing. The employer will need to give careful consideration to any issues which are raised by employees about the results of any drug or alcohol tests. I will turn now to look at a couple of cases on that issue. Firstly, in the case of First Bristol Limited and Bales, Mr Bales was employed as a bus driver for 21 years and had a clean disciplinary record. He was dismissed for failing a drugs test. Mr Bales appealed against the dismissal. He raised the following issues. He was taking antibiotics and questioned whether this could have produced a false positive. He had been handling banknotes which are known to be contaminated by cocaine and eaten his sandwiches and may have unknowingly consumed cocaine. And also, he obtained a hair strand test at considerable expense which showed no cocaine use for a 90 day period. When Mr Bales' appeal was unsuccessful, he lodged a claim for unfair dismissal. His claim was successful and the decision was appealed by the employer. 
The Employment Appeal Tribunal sent the case back to the judge who had heard the original claim for it to be reconsidered and noted that the judge was entitled to take the following factors into account. The initial disbelief that Mr Bales had taken cocaine, such that he was not suspended. Mr Bales' very long service. And the fact that Mr Bales had obtained a hair strand test at considerable expense, which showed that he was not a regular cocaine user, which would have been a waste of money if he knew that he had taken cocaine. Employers should also give consideration to the possibility that carrying out drug and alcohol testing infringes employees' rights to a private life under the Human Rights Act 1998. Random drug and alcohol testing of employees involves testing employees for drugs and alcohol that may have been consumed outside working hours, but which are still in the employee system when they are at work. It has been argued that this infringes the Human Rights Act. For this reason, before introducing drug and alcohol testing, the employer should consider the impact the testing may have on its employees' private lives and ensure that it has a good reason for introducing the testing, which is proportionate to the potential consequences for the affected employees. Looking now at the case of O'Flynn and Air Links, the Airport Coach Company Limited. In this case, the employee was a customer care assistant. His duties included manoeuvring vehicles and serving hot food. The employee was dismissed after testing positive for cannabis, which she had taken over the weekend, following random screening under the employer's drug and alcohol policy. The employee admitted that she was aware of the policy and that testing positive could result in dismissal. The Employment Appeal Tribunal held that the employer's alcohol and drugs policy was binding on the employee and that she had carried on working for the employer after the policy was introduced without complaining. The Employment Appeal Tribunal took into account the nature of the employee's duties which raised the issue of safety. In the circumstances, random testing was proportionate and the dismissal was within the range of reasonable responses and fair. Key factors in the tribunal's decision that the dismissal was fair included the fact that the employer had a policy in place which had been brought to the employee's attention, the fact that the employee knew that having drugs in her system could result in dismissal, and the fact that the employee's duties affected the safety of members of the public. Finally, I'd like to look briefly at data protection issues. The General Data Protection Regulation came into force in May 28, uh, and also the new Data Protection Act came into force in the UK at the same time. Data relating to an employee's health comes within the definition of special category data under the GDPR. In order to lawfully process special category data, the employee needs to be able to identify both a lawful basis for processing and a separate condition for processing special category data. In the UK, processing of special categories of personal data will be authorised for employment purposes if the processing is necessary for the purposes of performing or exercising obligations or rights of the employer or employee under employment law. When the processing is carried out, the employer has an appropriate policy in place and the additional safeguards which are set out in the Data Protection Act are observed. An employer's rights and obligations which require processing of special categories of personal data may include ensuring the health, safety and welfare at work of workers and ensuring a safe working environment. An employer is likely to have an appropriate policy in place if it has a policy which 
explains the procedures for complying with the data protection principles in connection with the processing of data, and explains the employer's policies in respect of the retention and erasure of personal data processed, giving an indication of how long such personal data is likely to be retained for. This effectively means that the employer needs to have a comprehensive, up-to-date data protection policy in place before it will be permitted to process special categories of personal data under these provisions. The additional safeguards are that the employer must retain the appropriate policy document for a specified period of time, review and, if appropriate, update the policy from time to time, and make it available on request to the Information Commissioner's Office without charge. In addition, the employer is required to keep a record of its processing activities, which must include certain specified information. As drug and alcohol testing is intrusive, employers should only produce it if it is necessary, bearing in mind the employer's health and safety obligations to employees and third parties to ensure that employees are not acting under the influence of drugs or alcohol. It is likely to be lawful to spot test employees for drugs and alcohol as long as the employer has a good, up-to-date drug and alcohol policy and there is a justification for it in the circumstances. Employees must be made aware of the policy, what the testing entails, and that they may be subject to both random and for cause testing. The Information Commissioner's Office's Employment Practices Code, which was based on old legislation, states that testing workers for drug or alcohol use is unlikely to be justified unless it is for health and safety reasons. So it's very important that the employer has a good reason for carrying out testing, and that reason in most cases will be that there is a good, sound health and safety reason for doing it. For example, um, the employees concerned are involved in driving vehicles or operating dangerous machinery or something of that nature. The code sets out the following guidelines. Only use drug or alcohol testing if it provides significantly better evidence of impairment than other less intrusive means. Tell workers what drugs they are being tested for. Limit testing to substances and the extent of exposure that will meet the purposes for which the testing is being conducted. Ensure random testing is genuinely random. Do not test all workers, whether randomly or not, if only workers carrying out a particular kind of activity pose a risk. The random testing of all workers will rarely be justified. Post-incident testing, where there is a reasonable suspicion that drug or alcohol use is a factor, is more likely to be justified than random testing. So, uh, to summarise, in respect of drug and alcohol testing, um, care, extreme care needs to be taken before doing it. You must make sure you've got a good policy in place. You must make sure that your staff are aware. And uh, it's very important to make sure you can justify the testing due to the nature of the employee's roles. So, possible action plan for employers then, some points to consider. Introduce a carefully drafted substance misuse policy, make sure staff are aware of it and that it's easily accessible. If you do have a policy, it's very important that you adhere to it, as we've seen from some of the cases we've looked at. And also, it's important to make sure that it's a, it's a sensible policy as well, so that you can adhere to it. Build health and wellbeing issues into induction programmes. Actively engage with staff about health and well-being and address any physical or cultural workplace factors that may be promoting drug and alcohol misuse. Consider carrying out staff consultations or surveys to uh, seek information from staff about their health and well-being and their perception of uh, work-life balance, drinking culture and work-related stress. Train managers to understand the rules and what to do if they suspect that an employee's drinking or drug use is affecting their work. Train managers to recognise problems with alcohol and drugs and train them to handle sensitive conversations. 
Also, make sure they know how to signpost sources of support for health and well-being. Take steps to reduce work-related stress in the workplace if there, there is a particular issue with drug and alcohol misuse. Provide materials for managers and employees on the risks associated with misusing alcohol and drugs, together, together with details of organisations that can help. Try to promote a culture where staff feel able to ask for help. Encourage managers to model healthy behaviours. Make sure any substance misuse policy and training problem uh, training program are regularly reviewed and updated and evaluate any substance misuse policy for results and identify opportunities to improve it. So this webinar has covered health and safety issues, signs of alcohol and drug dependency, dealing with drug or alcohol misuse as a health and conduct issue or all conduct issue, evidential issues, disability discrimination, drug and alcohol testing and data protection issues, substance misuse policies, and we've also looked at some of the key cases in this area. To conclude, if an employer knows or suspects that an employee is addicted to drugs or alcohol, its approach to managing the issue will depend on how the issue is identified, whether the individual accepts there is an issue, what the employee's role is, and what risk there may be to the employee himself, his colleagues, and the organisation as a whole. If the employer chooses to deal with the matter as a health issue and wishes to help the employee to recover from his addiction, the employer will need to have regular meetings with the employee, ensure he is receiving appropriate treatment and provide the employee with ongoing help and support. If the employer chooses to try to help the employee but there are long-term issues, a lack of trust in the employee or concerns that the employee could be putting himself or colleagues in danger, dismissal will often be justified provided that the employer has taken reasonable steps to address the issue, obtain medical advice, consult with the employee, and has given the employee enough time to get treatment. However, depending on the circumstances, an employer may take the view that it is more appropriate for drug or alcohol misuse to be dealt with as a conduct issue and for appropriate disciplinary action to be taken accordingly. In either case, case law has demonstrated that implementing a well-drafted substance misuse policy and adhering to it will often go a long way towards showing that any ultimate dismissal is fair. Implementing a good substance misuse policy and providing training for managers are excellent starting points for any employer which wants to get drug and alcohol issues under control. My name is Emma Tegadeen. I'm an employment law partner at Gunnar Cook. If you have any questions about today's webinar, please feel free to contact me using the contact details on the slides. I hope you've enjoyed this afternoon's webinar.